Welcome to Bald Guy DIY. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can use a keypad with an ESP32 microcontroller. As I say all the time, I love using the ESP32 microcontroller. It's a great combination of price, performance, and features. In this video, I want to show you how you can hook up an external keypad to an ESP32 and the programming that you need to do in order to get it to work, either just to receive input or to be able to use it as a code, which is my intended purpose, in order to be able to enter a code and trigger an outcome in an escape room puzzle. So without further ado, let's jump into it. After loading the Arduino IDE, we need to add the library for the keypad. And if you go to manage libraries and type in keypad, once it refreshes the list, you'll find there are quite a few different libraries for keypads. The one that I'm using is just simply called keypad. So you do have to scroll through several, probably half a dozen or, or more before you get to one that's simply just called keypad. And then of course, once you find it, click the install button. As you can see here, I already have it installed. Once it's installed, you can go to the example sketches, scroll down to your custom libraries and find the one for keypad. There's a great little sample sketch called custom keypad, which when you load it, you can see the simplicity of it. Of course, it gives credit to the authors at the top and then it gives you that important include statement at the beginning, which includes the keypad library. You need to declare how many rows and columns there are for your keypad. The one I'm using is four and four, so it really doesn't matter. But for most cases, if you're using a three by three, of course you'd change that up. That's gonna determine how it maps out the keypad itself. As you can see here, this character value called hexakeys is the actual layout. So you just need to map out the characters based on the keypad you're using. This is the layout of the one that I'm using, numbers, letters, and the asterisk and pound sign. So all you need to do is go through and map all of those over, making sure that you put all of the values into quotation marks because they are part of a character variable. After you've mapped out your keypad, you need to go and declare which pins you're going to be using for the rows and which ones for the columns. If you look at your actual keypad, you'll see that the pins are typically laid out from left to right. The first half of them are the rows and the next half are the columns. So in my case, I have eight total leads. The first four are the rows, second four are the columns. And so I've laid them out here and what the actual values are going to be for my ESP32. Here's a little chart of the connections that you need. You could make them other pins, of course, if you'd like. But these are the ones I chose to use and they're based off of something that I also saw in a tutorial that I mentioned later on in this video. As you can see by the column heading, I did go left to right on the keypad pins in order to line them up rows and columns as the code required as well. Once your connection's figured out, you do need to declare this keypad function, which is going to assign the keypad and initialize it to the custom keypad term, or you could call it anything you want. That's the one part of it that you could change is just name it to something else if you'd like. You need to begin the serial monitor in order to display the keys that we're going to be pressing. And then the loop is very simple. You're just going to create a new character that's called custom key and use the get key function pointing at the name of your keypad in order to display that. If custom key exists, in other words, if there's a value, it's going to print it out to the serial monitor. And if we take a look at what that actually looks like, once you've uploaded the sketch, you can see here every button that you press shows up correctly with the label that I entered. If I had put different labels on, then one button would bring up something different, which could be fun, I guess, in some kind of translation puzzle, but generally you want the correct thing to show up. As you can see here, it looks like I missed number seven. So I go back and check. Yeah, indeed, that is working correctly. Of course, if you wanted to just have a particular action triggered when one value is pressed, you could create an if statement instead. In this case, I chose the letter C. So if C was pressed, that was the custom key that was detected. Then you could, instead of just printing any custom key, you could print just C. By doing this, it means that if you push any of the other buttons, nothing's going to happen, but only the one that I've declared in the if statement. So now any kind of code could be executed once I press that one value, which means that you could program all sorts of different things up to 16 different actions just by assigning it to a different button. As you can see here in the demo, none of the things work except C because that's the only one I've declared. 
can make a more advanced project and be able to enter in a sequence or code that needs to be matching the master code, I went to this website called DIYI0T.com and took a look at what he had to offer. He does a great job of explaining how all of these keypad mechanisms work, how the values are detected by the microcontroller, and even the layout of the rows and columns. So if you still haven't got that figured out, it's a great reference to help you with that. He also lays out a connection diagram here for the ESP32, which is the same one as I showed in my code earlier. He has a great example sketch here as well, which does basically the same thing as that custom keypad sketch. But if you scroll further down, he has a, an example code for a password lock, and that's what I want. I'm going to copy the information from his example code into my Arduino sketch. But as you can see from me scrolling through the page, he uses an LCD display to show the input and also a verification if the password was correct, where I'm not going to do that because I'm using an escape room puzzle that isn't going to have a screen like that. When they've entered the correct code, it's just going to trigger the next action, and so I don't need that output. On my code, I'm going to strip all of the unnecessary liquid crystal things away and just comment them out so that you can see it without. So if we go over to my Arduino sketch, you can see here I have commented out the two libraries that are needed for the liquid crystal display and I squared C, and then I have the exact same initialization all the way through. He also leaves options here for you to have other connections, but I've just commented those out and uncommented the section for the ESP32 because that's what I'm using. Again, same keypad initialization. In his code, it's just called keypad, not custom keypad. And then he uses these variables to set up code. You need the length of the code, it has to match, and then it's carried through to two different arrays. One, which is the master key or master code. The other, which keeps track of the keys that have been entered. He also uses this Z variable, which keeps track of how many digits have been entered so far. You need the serial begin as well. And I've again, com and I've again commented out all of the liquid crystal stuff. And then we get into the loop, which again is very similar to the original. You're simply going to store in a character variable the get key command and put the current input into that variable. If that variable exists, if there is an input stored, then it's going to create these different cases. You could use if statements here as well, but he chose to use cases. If you press the star or asterisk, it's going to break and start the code over again. If you press the pound, it's going to enter it and then do a validation. In my case, I don't need to do that validation. I want it to trigger as soon as there's four digits entered. So I'm just going to comment out that section for when the pound button is pressed. And finally, the default of pressing any other key means that it's going to print out that key just for your own reference, and it's going to add that key to the array for attempts. Lastly, it's going to increase the number of digits. I added this last if statement on here because I want to automatically initialize a check of the code when the number of digits equals the length of the code. It's going to automatically call this check key, which otherwise wouldn't have been called until the pound symbol is pressed. Depending on your use, you might want one or the other, but in either case, once you've got a full code entered, it's going to run this check key function. The check key code is fairly simple, basically creates a for loop which steps through each digit of both the attempts and the master arrays and compares them. For each one that's correct, it's going to increase the correct variable from zero, which it started with, and add one for each correct response. Next, if the correct number of responses equals the length of the key or how long the code is and also the number of digits entered also equals the key, which is a little bit unnecessary, that second part in my code, then it's simply going to say this was the correct key. The correct number of responses match the number of digits and we're good to go. It's going to print correct key and then it's going to delay. His default delay is three seconds. Mine I reduced to 300 milliseconds because it's not printing out to an LCD and it can reinitialize pretty quickly. For my purposes, this could be the the end of the code in terms of the correct responses, but in his case, he has it cycle back over to the beginning of the loop every time it proves whether the code was correct or incorrect. So where I could just stop right here and put in the trigger that I want for my event, he continues on to reset the number of digits to zero and then print once again to the LCD display that is attached in his example to insert the password again. In my case, I changed it, changed it to print out to the screen again, but it's really unnecessary because I would probably stop there with a while state.
If the incorrect key is entered, it simply displays incorrect key and again delays. I chose to make it only 300 milliseconds, sets the number of digits back to zero and prints once again, insert password. The last couple of lines is a for loop, which simply goes through each of the spaces inside the array for attempts and sets them all back to zero or to blank so that they can be entered again. If you didn't do this, it would mean you could just press the pound key and it would verify that once again, you entered the correct key. So by doing this, it resets all the keys to empty again. If we take a look at this in action, you can see that for my case, every time I enter four digits, it does a check. And if I put the wrong password, of course, it says incorrect key. If I put the correct password, Word, it says correct key. And because I left that looping action in place, you'd have to do it over and over again to get the correct or incorrect response. In my case, I'll probably lock it out. So once it's solved, it doesn't need to be solved again. That's just how easy it is. So that's all the basics that you need to understand in order to get a keypad connected, do the basic setup in the software, and then be able to do something with it to create the intended triggers or outputs that you want in your code. What you do with it beyond there, is almost unlimited. You could use it to enter a code and trigger some kind of action in an escape room puzzle, like I mentioned I'll be doing, and many other things using this simple concept of an external keypad. What would you use a keypad for? Let me know in the comments or send me an email, my information's in the description below. If you like this kind of content, please give the video a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel as I post a new video every week on a variety of DIY topics. I love exploring new concepts, trying out the basics, but then adding to them and creating all sorts of projects from those foundations. So if you like that kind of thing, be sure to come back and check out the other things I'm working on week after week. Until next time, in all your DIY projects, just keep pressing, just keep pressing, and don't be afraid to be bolder.